before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a very anticipated show, part two of the Stacey Peterson disappearance, which our friend Tommy Scoville. How you doing today, Tommy? I'm doing great. Great to be here. You know all the details, you guys. And so I do. I not to rehash anything, guys, but I will put the episodes, the previous episodes down in the description box. Um, please make sure you are subscribed to Tommy's channel, The Lifeboat. Um, you have an array of, of stuff from helping people go through recovery, from talking about the judicial system and the court system, which is so fascinating. Um, all these life skills that you've developed that you're now able to help other people work through some stuff. And you know what's great about you, Tommy, too, is that sometimes these, these things that happen in our life especially with the court system with re rehabilitation sometimes the officials will use words and phrases that kind of seem overreach like we don't really understand as as like laymen we don't understand but you're able to come in and explain things in such a, a way that it makes sense and it helps people to kind of understand what's going on in the world around them so i will tell you guys please 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 go and make sure you are subscribed to tommy's channel for all sorts of things especially if you love true crime because he did a fantastic job covering the danny masterson shit show we'll say finally that man got some justice so um, so and now talking about another man who is kind of serving justice, but not it's not totally served yet because Stacy, his what third wife was that his third or fourth wife? That is his third wife. Yeah. She is still quote unquote missing, and he is suspected Correct. of killing her. So I'm going to pass the ball over to you, Tommy, wherever you want okay, to start excellent. with this. Yeah. So just a quick re just a quick rehash for anyone that uh, that hadn't heard. I ended up at a uh, medical uh, yard in the Bureau of Prisons because of. Uh, some shots to the head, it's a cerebral infarction, and I had a, a dead spot, and they were wanting to monitor this. Uh, so I was, there's only certain yards you can go to if you have certain medical conditions. So I ended up on this yard for a, a medical hold, and so did Drew. And Drew got a job working in the kitchen. And as I was walking through uh, one day, the uh, woman who ran the kitchen walked up and just said, um, do you have a college education? And I said, I do. And she said, would you be willing to work in the kitchen? And I said, you know, I'm not didn't really want a job. You know, I, I, I was doing a bunch of stuff with rehab and helping guys. And I worked uh, doing a lot of law cases in the law library. So I said, you know, I'm not really looking for it. Uh, honestly, I took the job because Drew Peterson was the other person in there. Uh, there was something fascinating to me about the fact that Drew was there. And you don't get that close to, uh, to, to people that, you know, sort of was in, were in the public life. And what was amazing is I walked in the room and the first time I met Drew, he looked at me and he went, I know you. And I went, you know me? And he goes, yeah, I know you from somewhere. He's like, we got to go over uh, where you've lived and stuff because we've met. I'm like, no, we haven't. And he's like, no, I think we have. I'm like, you're Drew Peterson, bro. Like if, if we had met, I would remember meeting Drew Peterson. Like I know who you are. You know, I, that was not a mystery. And he goes, well, don't believe everything that you hear, you know? And uh, there was a third guy standing there at the time who goes, that ah, doesn't bother me. I'm a big fan of your work you know, making sort of a joke. The guy yeah. obviously wasn't a, a fan of his wife or whatever, but Drew, uh, so I got a job working with Drew Peterson, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. And we did that for a year and a half. And it was he and I in an office that was about eight feet long and about five feet uh, wide. So it was just two of us in a concrete box all day. And we had access to uh, a little bit of privilege. Um, we were we could go into the the staff kitchen and basically cook what we want when we wanted. We had ultimate access to the kitchen, which is kind of nice because you don't eat anything good ever in prison. So having the ability to eat what the cops ate 
was worth whatever you know you were putting up with. And Drew maintained his innocence through the entire time that uh, we worked together. He had tons of stories, and every story was just about what a rock star he was. Right? I mean, honestly, every story was about he met Pink, um, and uh, he met this person, and he met that person, and he really. He's a narcissist, right? Drew is about the biggest narcissist I've ever met in my life. It's so obvious within two minutes of meeting the guy that um, his favorite subject is, is, is Drew. And because of that, he can't shut up. And he kept going over the case and, and telling me why he was innocent and all of that. And I think I said this in the last uh, time we spoke. One day we were sitting there and he was talking about the minister in the case. And if you're familiar with the case, Stacy was getting counseling from a minister as was Drew. At one point, they both were. And Drew went, F you. And this is a quote. He told me, he told the guy, F you. I want nothing to do with any of this. You're just after my wife. He thought the minister, who was a young, attractive guy, may have had the hots for his wife. And this was really starting to grate on Drew. It's a subject that he brought up again and again, and would always say that they were effing and this and that. You know. So what ended up happening with this, uh, with um, Drew, is that as he gets older, he slips. So he's sitting there one day and he goes, you know, when that when that minister testified against me at the trial and all the BS and he was listening to BS and he goes and Stacy's BS and I went, Stacy didn't testify against you, Drew, right? And he goes, No, Stacy was dead by then. And and I just I, as soon as he said it, I went, She was what, Drew? And he goes, Well, that's what everybody says. And I go, No, brother. I go, Look, I'm not the cops. I got a year left on my sentence. I'm not going to cut a deal to try to get out of prison to turn you in. That deal would take two years. I said, You got you. You know, you don't have to worry about me, bro. I said, But you're slipping. You know, because I promise you, you just told me that you killed your wife and the subject died. He said, I didn't kill my wife. And he chuckled about it. And the subject uh, died. And then one day we were sitting there and somebody had taken a piece of paper and with tape on either side and they had taped it to a blue barrel in the kitchen. And they wrote on the uh, blue barrel, check this one for Stacy. And the reason is there's been a lot of hubbub in this case about a missing blue barrel, like a 50 gallon uh, storage blue barrel that his brother-in-law said he helped Drew move and it was warm, right? Now, according to Drew, this is something the brother-in-law said to, to gain some notoriety. And, and I think I, I may believe Drew on this. The brother-in-law was a drug addict. When he came out with that statement, he was living in a weekly rent motel. The guy's kind of a mess. And I don't know that uh, he wrote a lot of this. He was going from place to place to do interviews and they were paying for him to get there and paying for him to eat. Uh, I think he saw this kind of like Drew did, except he didn't like the, the uh, spotlight as much, which is why he kind of disappeared. But the persistence of this blue barrel never went away. And then one day I was on the yard with Drew and uh, it was me and Drew and another guy another inmate who I've spoken to since interviewing with you. And he's not too tripped out about this. If we ever need uh, him to come on and corroborate, he said he would do that. But uh, the three of us were walking the yard and we were drinking, right? We had purchased um, moonshine that had been made at the facility, right? A guy can build I'm a from cell. the South. I know all the, about the moonshine. <laughs> this is the real deal. This is this was real deal uh, moonshine. It was made with, uh, with started out with corn. And this stuff was, you could light it on fire. And the three of us got a pretty good glow going. And, and it was raining. And there was nobody on the yard. And we were walking around. And there are two yards there. We were on what, what we would refer to as the South Yard. And uh, it was raining. And we were just walking and talking. And it wasn't me. It was the third guy who didn't work with us, who had met Drew a few times. And he goes, so Drew, did you kill your wife or what? <laughs> right. Just came out with it. He's like, seriously, man, did you kill your wife or what? And Drew goes, I didn't kill my wife. And I said, oh no, he did. I said, he admitted to me that he did. I said, he does. He didn't mean to admit that he did, but he did. And I kind of told the story and, uh, and I said, and uh, apparently she's in a blue barrel because they were joking about it yesterday in the chow hall and made reference to the blue barrel with the sign on it. And Drew said, she ain't in the barrel. And for the next 15 minutes, we walked around that yard and he told us what happened. And his, he started it by saying, you guys can do whatever you want because they wouldn't, they probably wouldn't believe you at this point. And I don't think anybody cares. That was his icebreaker. Now I'm going to say this too. I'm doing this right for two reasons. Number one, the feds don't care because I called them straight up. Right. I tried to do this the right way first. I tried to call the feds. I met with them. I talked to a couple of people there. They really, this case, as far as they're concerned, Drew's going away and they don't seem really interested in, uh, in my opinion, in trying to find Stacy.
But what Drew uh, did to his kids when he walked out was to, to say to, to, to the kids, you know what, your mom walked out on you and she just didn't care enough to come back. And his daughter's name is Lacey and she is getting to, uh, to adulthood. And, you know, for this entire time, this child has thought mom just didn't. Uh, and that's what dad says. The mom didn't care enough and she just walked away to be with some other dude. It's not what went down. So what happened is, according to Drew Peterson, he came down the stairs and, and I'm going to, we're going to do this. And I apologize if this is offensive, but I'm quoting Drew Peterson at this point. Drew said that she came down the stairs and fucking me pumps. And he said she had on a mini skirt and he said to her, uh, go in to see the uh, priest for a tryst. I'm paraphrasing, but he said something about going to, to see the uh, priest to, uh, to screw around at which point she attacked him. Now I don't believe that for a hot second any more than anyone else listening to me does, but I'm telling you what the guy told me at that point, she had come at him and he grabbed her and put her in a headlock. And apparently there are stairs in this kitchen. Or so he tells me, tells me, I've never seen the man's house, but he said there were stairs in the kitchen. And in the process of wrestling her to the ground to subdue her, he broke her neck. This is the story that he told the two of us while we walked. Um, and so I said, well, then what? Right? Because this woman has disappeared off of the face of the earth. And there are a lot of people that have been looking for uh, Stacey Peterson. This is not a case where there weren't a ton of people walking fields. They used dogs. They used everything. Now, here's what I will tell you. And I will preface this by saying Drew Peterson would not be above trying to use any person that he's talking to to score a point against anyone else. Right? So I'm just going to tell you what Drew Peterson told me. Drew has owned bars, right? Through a lot of his life, he, he owned a bar, um, several different bars over the course of the time that, that uh, he was a, a cop. He had a girl that uh, worked at the uh, at this bar that he would mess around with, right? In spite of the fact that he was married or whatever. And she would follow him basically from place to place. They were quite close. Uh, and this girl married. They continued to have a relationship, but she married someone. And the person she married owned a funeral home. Now, I don't know if, and I'll give you all this, Bryce, and you can decide what to do with it afterwards. I don't know if you say the names of funeral homes and things like this out loud. We, maybe you can decide what you want to do with that later. I don't think it's a great idea. But the, the, the woman's name, I have all it. Like, I'm, I'm that guy. So I remember the name of the woman. I remember the name of the funeral home. I'm not looking to get any of us sued, but I will happily give all that to you. I, gave, I happily gave all of it to the feds. And uh, the thing with Drew is this. Drew is such a manipulative piece of shit sorry, that everybody that has ever interviewed this guy is in danger of like, he might just hate this chick, right? He might just hate this woman and sees a guy getting ready to leave. Everything he does is, uh, is calculated, but there was no reason whatsoever to tell me he killed his wife, right? It's counterproductive to every single thing this dude could do. I think the reason that Drew admitted that she was dead was because he was so busted. Like the day that he said that, the day that he went, now she was already dead. Like we were, we were sitting like you and I are right now. Right. And I just leaned in and went, she was what Drew? Like, and it was, it was that moment where he looked at me and I looked at him and, and there was no reason anymore for this dude to uh, believe for a second that I was buying any of the lie. You know, the, the crazy thing about Drew is his, his mission in life is to influence every person that he meets in regards to, to his guilt or innocence. He can't shut up. Like he, he, we went to a medical yard. Drew, if Drew had shut up at this medical yard, he probably could have walked the yard, right? He probably could have survived there because people will, no one was coming up to me for the first five months. No one said to me, you work with Drew Peterson? Like literally not one person said it to me. I never got anyone that said, you know who that is? Nothing. Um, but Drew being Drew, has to, I mean, he couldn't be on a yard where he wasn't famous. That wasn't, so he immediately started getting attacked. You know, as soon as people found out who he was, uh, Drew started getting attacked, you know, constantly. There was always somebody attacking Drew. And, uh, you know, for a guy that was a cop and obviously terrorized a lot of women, he wasn't very good at, uh, at terrorizing men, right? Uh, the guys that went at Drew, he was not particularly effective um, defending himself. Right. And one day I got put into a position where I kind of had to defend him. And it was a, it was probably one of the most disgusting feelings I felt the entire time I was in prison. But the guy that came in to get him came into the office to do it. 
and this may not make sense to anyone else in the world, but allowing him to do that in that office kind of puts me in a position of being a punk in prison, right? Like this is my place. You just came in here and did whatever you wanted. So when he came in for the beef with, with Drew, you know, my thing was, Hey bro, you knock on a door, right? Like we're in prison. You know, as you walk in here, right? This is my little, little area. You want to kill him? That's fine. It's got nothing to do with me. Get out of here and do it. don't do it here. Kind of a thing. And, you know, hindsight being 2020, maybe I should have just uh, gone to the corner of the room and let the guy, uh, you know, work on Drew a little bit, but Drew got beat up a lot in prison, a lot. Yeah. Um, but right after I left, he got yanked out of the federal system and he is no longer in the feds. He got sent to the state and they will not say where, right? They're trying not to. Drew will screw that up because Drew, like I said, he cannot not be famous. Right. And Drew Drew was killing people. I, I wholeheartedly believe Drew's a serial killer. I wholeheartedly believe that there are way more people dead than the, than the number yeah. of people that they're talking about. I think that, I think Drew killed the first time when he was in the, uh, in the army. And I think he tried to tell me the story once and jerked the, uh, the e-break on it right around the time he realized that he was getting into stuff he shouldn't talk about. Uh, but you know, Drew, he, he worked as an undercover cop, right. And even as an undercover cop, he was very open and honest about how he used that. Right. So women who, uh, who got in trouble had an opportunity to get out of trouble, yep. you know, by, uh, by screwing around with Drew. And he, this was just a guy that took advantage of every situation he ever found himself in. And the amazing part is it's such a case study in humanity because you, you run into prison, people in prison, Bryson, we've talked about this before, I think off air, but you can, you can break, break them into groups and there's a group of people that need to be there. There's yeah. a group of people that are so sick that they need to be there. And Drew Peterson is one of them. Like greed puts people in prison and maybe they should be there, right? Or whatever. Right. But then there are right. people who are just evil. Um, and he killed uh, he killed his third wife because he just did not want to give her anything in the divorce. It was that simple. Um, he was very clear in, in talking about it. And I don't mean that, that he admitted to killing her. He, he denied killing uh, Kathleen to the, to the last day that I met him. He never once came clean. And that's he the said one he had he nothing to do with that. He got convicted. That's the that. one he got convicted. Correct. His and you know what no one says? Uh, yeah, Bryce, the, what, what no one says is that um, when they exhumed the body, like the second autopsy was not a who done it. It was a laid down. It was a how the hell did this not get caught the first time? And it, it amazes me that nobody yells about that. You know, because that was his. It was Bowling Brook Police, right? That's where he worked. You know, who covered up the the Drew Peterson murder? Because whoever did killed Stacy Peterson. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's literally exactly. Yeah. Is, and and as you said, I mean, I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if there are other. Uh, you know, as as I've said before, unfortunately, like prostitutes, stuff like that, they they are forgotten people and they shouldn't be, but they are. And so you, you even wonder, like, if there are even more missing people in that area that he could have, you know, um, and I, I absolutely think he, I mean, I don't think without a shadow of a doubt, he killed Stacy. And so you're saying, and we'll say allegedly, guys, but if anybody cares to find well, what happened to this woman to give this poor family closure, he took the body to a funeral parlor and incinerated it, right? That is what he says he did. Yeah. He said he called this girl and she said, there's no one here right now. If you can get here. And he said he loaded her into uh, the car. Uh, he drove over there and um, yeah, they burned her. That's what, uh, that's that why they what can't find said. the body. And I, said, and I said, what did you do with the uh, remains? He said, we didn't take the remains, left them, uh, left uh, the remains. He said, if you, if you do this kind of thing, it basically just grates down to the bottom. They didn't even remove any of it. According to uh, to Drew. Well, with that being said, could the cops potentially still get DNA evidence? Interesting, right? I mean, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff like that. That, um, and and here's the thing. I I understand. I understand that the feds, in the in the day and age that we live, then right, everybody would like to be famous for ten minutes, and I understand why the cops have to to view everything. But um, like, go through the go through the the prison jacket. You're not going to find a lot of guys, maybe cellmates, right? But that lived uh, with him. But I spent a lot of time with this guy, right? right? Waking hours with nothing to do but talk to him. Um, they weren't they weren't particularly interested in anything that a convict had to tell them. And that was they said it nicely, but that's pretty much how they said it, that. And the funny thing is, I'm out, right? Right. Like, here's the deal: if I was in prison and I was trying to cut a deal to get time off of my sentence, right? But I didn't do any of that crap. I didn't wrap this out. This, honestly, people, this is for the kid, right? This is for his daughter because I would rather think that my mom was murdered than that my mom decided she didn't want to have anything to do with me. And this is a sad side note. Uh, Stacy's mother did that, 
Yeah. In real life. Stacy yeah. mother, Stacy uh, Peterson's uh, mom actually did run away. And Drew's argument has always been, this is, this is in that family. This is what that family does. And I know he thought about it before he got rid of her. I know that because the, of the way the gears turn in that man's head, you know, I know that that was something that, that, you know, here's another thing that doesn't get brought up a lot, but if you look at the timeline of Stacy Peterson and Kathleen, Drew was still with Kathleen when he was starting his relationship with Stacy. At that point, she was a minor, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and he would take her to the house that is marriage house. And he would be with her in the basement while his wife was upstairs. It was a terrible situation. Right. But poor Stacy found herself in this because there's, I, I promise you, and I'm not trying to bum anyone out or anything else, but she knew what happened because she was his alibi for uh, for his uh, third wife, right? The alibi of why Drew was not convicted for that crime or thought, you know, anyone thought about it was because Stacy had said he was with me at the time that that happened and he wasn't, he killed that woman. So he had his wife lying about, so she had already knows he's a killer, she, right? And is already thinking to herself, he got away with the perfect murder once, right? right? She had to be living in terror. And we know uh, that she told, that's what she was telling the priest. Every time they were together, he's going to kill me. He's going yeah. to kill me. The priest testified to this. Um, and this is an unusual case too. If, if you've followed this one, they allowed, um, basically at that trial, um, they allowed in testimony that they never would have allowed into any other case in history. It would have been considered hearsay in any other case, but because Drew kills the witnesses, right? And, and makes them disappear. The judge made a ruling that they were going to allow statements that these people had made in the past to be read into the record. So basically, Kathleen got to testify from the grave because she had said too that Drew's going to kill me. He's going to make it look like an accident and he's going to get away with it, which is terrifying, right? I mean, she told everybody this and then he did it. And so the people at that police department- Dangerous. The judge even knew this man was dangerous. Yeah. All parties involved had to know exactly what was going on with Drew Peterson. And that really brings up the question, you know, the, he had been busted as a, as a, uh, as the crooked um, drug dealer. I mean, a, a drug cop, when he was working as a narc, he got fired. And the reason he was fired was he had set up a, a drug sting operation without permission. Now he didn't even BS that he was doing that because on those scores, they'd keep the money. So this was a criminal with a badge. Like this dude was never a cop. He really wasn't. There are great cops. We were talking about a couple of them. There are great cops on this planet that really do their job and that really get involved and they care. And um, yeah. But the reason that people hate cops are because of people like Drew Peterson. Like he is the example of what happens when you take somebody that just is a narcissist and a piece of crap and you give them authority over people, you give them a badge. And yeah, the, uh, the number of victims that this guy has victimized in one way or another, I can't even imagine. Like you said, prostitutes. I mean, this is a guy that was working drug crimes. The number of women that I would imagine Drew, um, you know, assaulted or victimized. He's a, he's a very sick individual. He really is. Uh, it was, um, and, you know, toward the end, right as I was leaving, and this is just a side note, because when I got there, you watch how people change in prison. Because when I got there, Drew was homophobic, like viciously homophobic. And uh, a lot of jokes about that. Um, because this was a medical yard, you get it all kinds, right? This is not a prison. I mean, it is and it isn't, but medical yards get everybody there. You have to go you, and you're only going to be there for a short period of time. And usually then you're going to uh, to leave. But we had um, people who were there getting hormones, right? There were people on that yard. And uh, right before I left, Drew apparently changed his uh, theory on the entire thing and moved in with a, uh, a trans um, woman. Yeah, right before I left, that was Drew's... Uh, Change in cellmate. It was actually our last conversation. I said to him, Drew, did you move uh, so-and-so in? I said, he goes, yeah. I go, just tap out or what's the deal on that one? And uh, he goes, no, of all of the people in the unit, it's actually the kindest person in there. I said, well, good for you, Drew. I would be terrified <laughs> if I were that trans person. I'd be like, I don't I would not. Yeah. I mean, honestly, he, so I've told this story, I think the last time, but you, you buy a photo ducket for two or three bucks and Drew on photo day, Drew would be there like the cutout that you put your arm around or whatever, like every inmate there loving every one minute of picture, this. loving every minute of it. And he would, he had like, like stock signatures he would do on the back of the cards and he charged these guys money to do it. It'd be like $10, a book of stamps. And he'd write on the back uh, to, to, uh, to my star pupil, right? 
like a, a class for uh, marriage counseling and things like that. Bad, bad jokes. Um, everything he he just it's a constant thing with him. He jokes about her disappearance ten times a day. It's like he doesn't want people to forget that there's a missing girl out there. And within the system, there's a very large reward um, that has been posted for information. And uh, you know, every inmate Drew, Drew seems to really uh, get off to the fact that everyone is hoping to get that cash. Like it's Drew's, it's almost like Drew sits there and thinks I'm worth a half a million dollars, right? Because of this information. Right. And, the, you know, uh, and he just, he's a very sick person. He did a, a scam from inside with the, uh, with the National Enquirer. They set up this, this whole scam where Drew started writing letters to a guy that had just left from prison. And the, I think the, the, it was called Drew Peterson stole my wife from prison or something was like the headline on uh but the guy sold the um the story for five grand and drew was going to get you know 2500 of that kicked back to his books so he's constantly trying to be relative on the outside right, right? the the one thing that that blows me away and i talked the um to my friend that was walking with me that day um and i said to him uh i just i think if peterson did it he'd almost want the world to know for the fame you know what i mean like that always threw me off but my friend who his name is Austin and he's pretty slick, but Austin goes, the day he does the relevance is over. Yeah. There's no more. Exactly. Right? It's, 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 it's what's it's keeping, it's what's keeping him alive is the fact that she's missing. And I think his biggest fear is that that's going to go away. And, and it didn't occur to me. I mean, it, when Austin said it, like, it was like a light bulb went off, but it really is. That's what's keeping this alive for him is that no one has ever been able to find uh, his wife. And he feels like he got away with the perfect crime. Well, it's but almost like, I think he knows he killed her. We know he killed her. He knows we know he killed her, but there's no evidence. So he can still keep playing that cat and mouse game to keep himself relevant and famous, which is such a fucking shame because that's a human being. And that's the mother of one of his children. Like that is so disgraceful um, that he's doing that. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't even think about his child. Well, look what he's done to his other kids. Yep. Right. So his his son by uh, from his his uh, first marriage is raising all of his other kids. And by all accounts, just in case he sees this, the guy's an ace. Oh, right? uh, yeah. By I, all accounts, yeah. this is a great human being, a really, really solid human being. And he's having to come to grips with with this. You know, he's having to come to grips with the fact that, you know, his, his dad did this. And I saw him in an interview where he said that, you know, this is this is a difficult thing. He knows his dad's lying. You know? I think the yeah. whole planet knows Drew Peterson's lying. I uh, I have the misfortune of uh, of seeing him lie, right? Like I caught that dude mid lie, and the look on his face when I said she was what Drew, like there was that pause, and he went, "Well, that's what everybody says," and it was the just, yeah, you saw it, point. yeah. Well, and and that mask, that's a that's a funny that you said that because that's a Drew Peterson thing. Like if you spend enough time around Drew, you're going to see that mask drop. And there's going to be like the first time Drew got attacked, the guy that I was there uh, and it was, we were in the kitchen and the guy that uh, attacked him used a weapon. He was trying to get his eyes. Like he had a, a, a improvised homemade weapon, a shank, a shank. And he was trying to get Drew's face. Like he was going for his eyes, but that when Drew went to the angry Drew, um, it's very, it's a very different person. He didn't do very well, but the the that look um, is something that there's also a clip of film of him where he screams at a group of people that are overhead as they're taking him out of a van, and you see this look on his face, and that's the look. And I think that I think most people who have seen that aren't around anymore. You know. Oh, and the other thing that I think is fascinating, Bryce, is that this dude really believes he's getting out of prison. No way. That's not a show. No, that is not a show. That dude believes wholeheartedly. He's planning what he's going to do when he gets out of prison. Um, and by the way, a little bit of justice. A little bit of justice is Drew is one of the only people in history, in history, that have ever lost a pension from the police department. That's not supposed to be able to happen. So wow. that is a little bit of justice because Drew would be getting ten or $15,000 a month, you know? Um, and they, and he was, when he first got arrested, he was living pretty good. They were putting a lot of money on his books and, you know, he had money to burn and, you know, all of that. And, uh, he lost his pension and I'm telling you, uh, you want to talk about what really makes that man mad. The fact that his pension is gone is, is that makes him more angry than anything on earth. 
He's not even worried about his. T- you know, it's so interesting. There's another. There's uh, the famous murder of Coweta County, which I've kind of talked about on my show. It's uh, the reason why it's such a famous murder is because they had an oracle. Mahaley Lancaster down here in the South was one of the prime witnesses because she was a fortune teller. And so she could point to where the body was. Right. And it was in like the 19, like, like 40s, 50s, something like that. So it was a very wild case. And they actually made a movie, a book. They wrote a book about it. They made a movie out of it. And Johnny Cash played the pol- police officer. Andy Griffith played the murderer. And June Cash played Mahaley Lancaster. Well, the interesting thing about oh, this, it's a true story, you guys. This guy killed a man right in broad daylight, but he thought he was in Meriwether County. He was across the line where he kind of ruled the roost because he was like main honcho and he kind of had the police officers under his grip, but he was actually across the line in Coweta County. So a different judicial system. But this guy, and they show it in the movie when Andy Griffith, that he literally thought he was going to get off up until the point where he was about to go to the electric chair, he thought someone was going to come in and bring him home for dinner. And he was the first man to absolutely be convicted to death from the testimony of two black men here in Georgia. So it's it's the same thing. He literally, and they showed up to the point where they were shaving his head for the electric chair. He thought they were going to come get him out because he had that, he was that much of a narcissist. Like that's, that's, that's true. Broad daylight killed someone. And he was, he was happy when he was happy when the supreme court uh was taking up his case and he doesn't care if he loses it was the fact that there's going to be a supreme court case that is united states v peterson like to him this was you know i mean the, uh, there's no way i wish bryce that i could do justice um to the level of narcissism that this man displays in every single thing that he does he will tell you the same story if it's a good, if it, if it puts him in a good light, um, the story of the day that, so he went on uh, man cow, you know, that the, the talk show host, like a shock jock. He's a, like a lowercase Howard Stern kind of a thing. And he went on the man cow show and, uh, they did a deal called who wants to date Drew Peterson. Now keep in mind, Stacy's missing, right? She's been missing maybe two months at this point, three months at this point. And he's going around the country and he's doing, uh, and they're doing this thing. Who wants, who wants to win a date with Drew Peterson? He and his lawyer are doing this. And it's one of his favorite stories because of the reaction, but you know who they were going to, this is no lie, right? I actually saw correspondence because he's very proud of all of this stuff, but, uh, he was going to go on a date with, um, Casey Anthony. They had set up a date for Casey Anthony and Drew Peterson. And God only knows why, because his lawyer did everything else he could to destroy Drew Peterson's case. But at the last minute, the lawyer said, maybe this is in bad taste. Maybe this is in bad taste. A girl that killed her child and a guy that disappeared, his wife, were going to go out on a date. Maybe this is in bad taste. The guy's name is Brodsky, his attorney. And you want to talk about a guy that should not have a license to practice law? Drew Peterson's an idiot. But his attorney took him on a tour of the United States to go on every talk show in the country and talk about their case. He was riding that high as much as Drew was. If you watch the clips of film of the two of them in front of the, I mean, uh, of the legal team in front of the courthouse, they're cracking jokes about Stacy being missing. His legal team. Who? Stacy who? Oh, she, where, where is she? Like laughing about it and clowning with sunglasses on. It's one of the most disturbing. He is one of, he's as sick as Drew Peterson is, and that's no joke. And Drew tells stories of the two of them in Florida going to sex clubs and like they were touring no. the country, partying like a rock band. For real. That's what they were doing. They I were mean, touring the country, partying like a, like a rock band. If my partner went missing and he'd been missing for two months, I would still be in a state of mourning and devastation trying to find and figure out what happened. Right. Even if you're a psychopath, you should obviously know that going around, this doesn't look good. Like this does not look good. And this, where are you, this is a bad look, right? Your child. Why aren't you consoling your child whose mother is just walked out as you claim? Like this is. He, he was allowing women to try on Stacy's bikinis within six weeks of her missing. He was dating a girl. Now this girl tells the story after the fact. She doesn't know any of this, but she's in there and he's like, yeah, try that on. He was talking, he was saying it was his ex-wife stuff. Not this is my missing wife stuff, but the girl's in there trying on her, her, her bikinis. Like this is, this is everything he did. The crazy thing, Bryce, is that there is no body, right? There's nothing. If Drew had shut up and gone into his house 
and not filmed everybody and not toured the country and gone on Howard Stern and all of that. By all accounts, the first, you know, there was no evidence. There was nothing. But right. he made such an or, a, a, a spectacle of himself that he was, he, he bragged that they had gone to Europe and that he was coming through the airport. He said, and there were 13 different newspapers at the airport in different languages. And he was on the cover of every one of them. And he told me that no less than a hundred times. And I'm not being funny. He told me that no less than a hundred times. And he said that as they got to, uh, they were joking as they were going through customs because his daughter's name is Lacey, Lacey, who is the name of the Peterson that was killed by Scott. Uh, yeah. So he was joking. He was joking in front of his daughter about her name to the to the uh, and, he, and he tells me the joke. I said to him, I go, Drew, you did that in front of your kid. You know what I mean? Like Disgusting. her mom's missing. Right. I mean, he's the sickest person I've ever met. There's, I don't feel bad doing what I'm doing. I'm going to catch crap from this. Guys are going to send me emails and say, you're not a convict and this and that, you know, that, that kid deserves better crap all yeah. over me. Do what you do. You know, yeah. that kid deserves better. And I'm, I'm pretty yeah. cool. With her. I, I could have ratted on him while I was in there. This isn't being a rat. I, I yeah, and that's, that. and that's the most important thing. And I think that's, and that takes his thunder away if they can. So what's the town again that he, where this, uh, we, we don't necessarily have to say the, Funeral parlor, but we can say the town in case people want to. It was it, it it was one town over from Bolingbrook. It was right near where uh, where this took place. Well, you, and, you know uh, what? And tell me, actually, let's just go ahead and say allegedly. If you want to say the name of the funeral parlor, we'll say allegedly. I will. I will send it to you. And here's what here's why I'm going to send it to you and let you do it. It's just because it is in business. It is still open, and to the best of my knowledge, these two are still married. So this, I just on the outside chance that this is him just starting a, you know, what okay. storm on a girl that, that treated him bad. That's my fear. Cause the guy's slick, like Drew's an idiot. He really is. But there's a part of Drew that is one of the most conniving. Yeah. And if this girl did him dirty, like I could completely see him going, you know what? Tommy's a, Tommy's a, a, a boy scout. He'll end up calling somebody, right? I could see him just trying to throw. So, and that's the, that's the one thing that scares me about the entire story. But the one thing I will tell you is of every part of that story, the only part I am absolutely 100 convinced he was telling me the truth of uh, was her death. I yeah. Mean, and was, that's the way, I mean, that's there's why no there's benefit. Nobody. And, and the fact that this woman, you know, I think about the other woman, the woman, the affair partner that he was having the affair with, you know, most people would 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 risk having their affair exposed and not be party to destroying a body unless they were a psychopath themselves or terrified of this man. Well, and here's the deal. How could you not be? So if you yeah. worked at this guy's bar, right? Picture picture yourself and you're an employee, you're at he was, she was a waitress, and this was the second or third place that he had owned that she had worked at. So she knows he's having a, a relationship with a 16 year old. Yep. Right. Out in the open, this girl sitting at the bar, he had to look to the entire town of Bolingbrook, Illinois, like he was untouchable. Right. Right. Wife three was in the grave. No problem. Right. She, she drowned in a bathtub, didn't have any water in it. You yep. know, there was just so much that everything about it stunk, but this guy lived the life where if you go back through the cases, each time he broke up with a, a wife or a girlfriend or whatever, he'd send cruisers by the house to terrify them. You know, they the Bolingbrook Police Department had been called to his house for domestic disturbances with Stacy 18 times. Wow. 18 times. Okay, wow. where I used to live, where I used to live, if they get called, someone's arrested, right? Yeah. Like the state of Nevada, if you get called on a domestic violence, someone goes to jail, it's procedure. One person's leaving in jail. So- 18 calls, 18 times. Now, by full disclosure, sometimes it was him calling the police on her, and sometimes it was her calling the police on him. Either way, it's 18 domestic disturbances. They were covering for this man until he killed somebody. And it seems to me to be the part of this story, Bryce, that nobody tells. Like, why isn't Bolingbrook Police Department on trial for killing Stacey Peterson? Because they killed her. They let him get away with murder. They let him do all the crap that he did. They went out and worked that crime scene, right? They went out and looked at Kathleen Salvia, and there was no doubt. I mean, the the the, the guy that did the, the second autopsy said, this is the most obvious. Like, she had signs of abuse all over her body. He couldn't do that, you know, without someone else in the room. But they just covered up for him. They should be ashamed the of themselves. part of the story that really gets missed. Yeah, they, they should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. Okay, so what I'll do, Tommy, then I will say if there's a cop in the area or somebody who is taking this seriously and wants to investigate, 
email me at esotericatlanta at gmail.com or you can contact Tommy. What's your email address, Tommy? Sober, S-O-B-E-R at myyahoo.com. And I guess we can go through the protocol of getting your batch number, making sure, and then we can, uh, Tommy, or I can send you to Tommy to get the information. Um, again, yep. yeah, because there is a child out there that needs to know the truth and needs Amen. to start the healing process of that trauma, knowing that your father killed. And, th you know, Tommy, you're right. The oldest son, I saw some interviews with him, and he sounds like a really amazing guy. And so I have to hand it. He sent me an email. He sent me an email. When I first got out of prison, there was an email waiting for me, and it was from drew's son and it was a very very nice letter and he he basically was saying my dad's trying to reach out to you from prison he'd like to talk to you and i don't know whether or not you ever want to talk to my dad i'd understand if you didn't you know he was very but he said uh you know if you if you ever wanted to reach out to my dad you could do it through me uh i never took him up on that because i didn't want to uh, have any correspondence with drew i did however reach out to him after the fact to say i intended to do this i didn't hear back from him he may have put up an email address just to deal with me and never deal with it again, right? Yeah. So I don't know, but I did try to reach out to him because I didn't want to uh, to do this without giving him a chance to for me to tell him first. But uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't hear from him. So yeah, well, but he okay. seems like an ace. He's yeah, taking care absolutely. of absolutely and, and being a dad. And that's the thing too. We we can't judge people by their parents because every human being has their own choices to make and their own. Um, I know that psychopathy and narcissism can be inherited. But it seems like all of Drew Peters, Drew Peters' wives were all incredible people. And so obviously his they children inherited people. souls from their mothers. And and so, I, I just, I, yeah, that's an incredible – that kid didn't have to do that. He didn't have to step in and take over custody of his siblings, but he did. And that's and, an and one of the And one of the kids he's raising is getting straight A's and is on his, getting a scholarship to go to school. Like he's doing a great job raising Amazing. these kids. Like he's really – he's really doing a great job. And it's – yeah, it's above and beyond the call. And And, and – I saw him interviewed and he said, you know, this, that was, this was the end of my life too, right? Yeah. This wasn't his plan. This isn't what he had any intention right. of doing. Right. So, you know, Drew, Drew destroyed the lives of so many people, including his son, who's just, again, you know, really has, has uh, taken up the mantle for the entire, uh, for the entire family. And, you know, uh, when I was with Drew, the daughter was rebellious had hit an age where she would occasionally let him have it on the phone and say, you killed my mother kind of a thing. And Good. he complained to me once about it. And I said, Drew, what, what do you think she's going to, you know what I mean? You think she's going to be happy? You know, and, you know obviously she's going to be, she's going to be upset, but maybe this, you know, maybe you can at least start to move forward with some closure. Your dad's a sick guy, right? But your mom cared about you to the very end. You know, that's what she was doing was trying to work with that priest to get out of there. So she could uh, take, you know, Lacey and be safe. So it was just a bad situation all the way around. Sad. Well, thank you really for sharing tragic. this. I mean, it, Tommy, this is amazing to, to hopefully turn a bad situation, help people get closure on it. And I will again, you guys, if you guys have any information that you want to share with Tommy or myself, you can contact us at the email addresses or if there is somebody that wants to look into this, again, if you email me, I'm just going to send you to Tommy because he knows more about this than I do. So, um, yeah, we do. And our heart goes out to anybody who's been a victim of domestic violence, who's come from abuse, abusive background. Amen. I mean, that is an awful thing to, to go through. And so uh, my heart goes out to all of you guys who've been through that. Don't, Tommy, don't suffer in silence. Reach out. No, right. absolutely. There are people out there that will help. And before we go, let me just real quickly, guys, I'm just going to pull up um, Tommy's channel quickly so you guys can make sure that you know what it looks like so that you can make sure you are subscribed to Tommy because he covers some awesome, awesome stuff. I actually just referred him a case myself before we started filming that I'm really excited. I hope you uh, take a look at this case that I referred to you, Tommy, because it's very interesting. So make sure that you are subscribed to Tommy, guys. Once again, I will be putting all of this in the description box below so that you yourself can get a chance to go check out all of his um, content. And I will put some other channels that he's a guest on a lot too. That's got some interesting stuff as well, you guys, because education, knowledge is power. Knowledge protects. The more we learn from each other, the stronger we are going to be as a collective. And so I thank you, Tommy, for, for being willing to put yourself out there and to answer these questions and to help people understand, you know, the way this works, all this works. Absolutely. So, it's right. not Yeah. And I apologize. My nose is running so bad, you guys. I had a rough day. So is mine. I, I've been doing this for the entire month. I've been doing it for the entire month. It's all good. I know the conspiracy. They're going to be in the comment section. I'm like, guys, listen, I had a rough day yesterday. Right, here so they go. It's a, so. <laughs> anyway, you guys. All right. Well, we. Um, I hope you guys all have a wonderful weekend. And we will we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.